next up is Nita Farahani who <coughs> at Vanderbilt, who, with an interdisciplinary background of um, genetics and uh, biology and biology, philosophy of biology, philosophy of law, um, extraordinary combination of things, is working in the area at the intersection of criminal law, genetics, and neuroscience and philosophy. She has a, <clears throat> a volume coming out that was edited called Genes and Justice, the Impact of Behavioral Genetics and Neuroscience on Criminal Law. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, and uh, thanks to all of you for what has been an incredibly interesting conversation over uh, the past couple of days. Uh, I have particularly enjoyed each of the different approaches to uh, science and the integration of each of the different areas. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you today about the use of neuroscience in the law. And my area is looking at the intersection of science, philosophy, and law. What I'm going to talk to you about today is my candle. So I'm starting with my candle because it's what unifies my talk a bit. Uh, so my candle is that the neuroscientific community and the behavioral scientific community needs to get involved in policy making. And I tell you that at the outset because I'm going to give you the examples of where they have not yet gotten involved and where they need to get involved because uh, the science is already being introduced into the legal arena despite the fact that the science isn't really ready to be introduced into the legal arena. So it's already being used and it's being used without the input of the scientist. And the scientists have the opportunity right now to stop and to say, look, the science isn't ready. The science doesn't say what you think it says. And yet, they have st stepped back and said, no, we're not interested in doing so. Okay, so the first such example is the very specific application of the use of neuroscience and behavioral genetics in criminal cases. So you've heard about that a little bit already from both Walter and from Amanda. But I'm going to give you some of the specific examples, not at the prediction level, but in specific cases. And one such case I was involved in was the case of Jeffrey Landrigan. So I tried to get involved in, I should say. So the case of Jeffrey Landrigan is a case in which an individual was, uh, committed a number of uh, violent acts of murder. And on appeal, so he was given the death sentence, and on appeal, uh, he claimed ineffective assistance of counsel. And his claim for ineffective assistance of counsel is there wasn't mitigating evidence introduced on my behalf. Now, why wasn't there mitigating evidence introduced on his behalf? Because he said, I'm not interested in having any mitigating evidence introduced on my behalf. He refused to cooperate with his trial counsel on having any evidence introduced on his behalf. But a new theory had been developed in the interim. The theory was a biological predisposition to violence. And his family had a long history of violence. All of the men in his family had been very violent. They committed a number of violent criminal acts. And he said, if somebody had told me about that, I would have cooperated. I would have allowed that evidence to be introduced on my behalf. And so therefore, it was ineffective assistance of counsel for failure to introduce a biological predisposition to violence. Well, he failed at the district court level. It went up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Ninth Circuit first, and a three-judge uh, panel said, well, really, that evidence was just as likely to be used against you as to be used for you, right? So they said, that's not really mitigating evidence, right? A predisposition to violence could have just shown that you were a remorseless killer and that you came from a long line of remorseless killers, right? So why would we be interested in that? Why would the jury be interested in that? Well, there's this thing about capital cases where you have to be able to be allowed to introduce that kind of evidence on your behalf. Even if it might have aggravating potential, it might also have mitigating potential. It might speak to your individual culpability or blameworthiness. So the Ninth Circuit heard the case on bonk. That means all of them heard it together. Well, not all of them because it's the Ninth Circuit, but normally all of them hear it together. And on bonk, they decided that that wasn't the right decision. Okay, so they said, that's not okay. He should have been able to introduce that evidence on his behalf. It went up to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court granted cert 
on the question of whether a genetic predisposition to violence is mitigating evidence. This is just a couple of years ago. That's huge. Is a genetic predisposition to violence was a question before the United States Supreme Court. Do the scientists know the answer to that question? Is there a genetic predisposition to violence? Right, so what did I do? I contacted the Behavioral Genetics Association, the National Association of Human Genetics, every organization that I could think of, and said, I would like to file, along with another, another lawyer, an amicus brief, neither in support of the petitioner nor in support of the respondent, a true amicus brief, okay, which means a friend of the court petition, to inform the court of what the science is, right, because nobody was talking about what the science said. Everybody was debating about whether or not a genetic predisposition to violence is mitigating evidence in the constitutional issue. Somebody needs to talk about what the state of the science is. And you know what the scientists said? The scientists all said no, every one of them. And I'll give you a quote from one of them. We do not feel the current data is sufficient to comment on the heritability of violent behavior and or genomic variation that may predispose to such. Yes, exactly, I agree. I said, so let's tell the court that, right? They said, no, no, we don't want to get involved in policy. We don't want the court or the media to think that we're commenting on such things. Who's going to, right? If the scientists aren't giving the opinion, if the scientists aren't giving the state of the scientists, who is going to give the state of the science? The lawyers? Happily, I have somewhat of a scientific background. But how many lawyers do you think have a scientific background? Not that many. And mine's outdated. I mean, I, you know, terrific that I have a scientific background, but I don't do scientific research anymore. And it would be helpful to have the scientific community actually comment. All right, that's in the early phase, right? That's in the stuff we actually know about. Now let me talk to you about what I think is even scarier, which is phase two, the military. The military has an enormous program, mostly funded by the black budget, What's the black budget? It's the part we don't get to know about. It's all classified information. Where they fund military research. Right now, the National Research Council has just published a pre-publication report that's about 160 pages long that talks about the use of neuroscience in the military. And they talk about some of the different potential applications of neuroscience and some of the ways in which neuroscience is already being funded. What happens to an individual scientist when they receive DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency funding, they go underground. Why? Because they have signed confidentiality agreements. They're no longer allowed to publish their information. Right? They're no longer allowed to publish their science. And who is making the ethical considerations about how the science can be used? Let me give you two such examples of the kinds of things that are in this report. And remember, this is the public information. Right? The science is far ahead of the public information and what's actually being used is, is uh, pretty far ahead of what's actually being revealed to us. So the first is brain detection and brain machine interfaces. Many of you have heard about the lie detection technology that's being developed for fMRI research, EEG, also near infrared um, research, right? The more portable, uh, likely deployment kind of technology for the military is using EEG or NIR technology because it's more likely to be actually deployed on the field. Well, through Freedom of Information Act requests, it's been shown that this lie detection technology has already been used in interrogation of terrorists or potential terrorists in at least 28 documented cases, right, by people in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan who are administering lie detection, whether it's through EEG, NIR, or fMRI. fMRI and PET scan is much less likely to be used in the field right now because it's large, right, not portable, much harder to administer, requires much higher expertise than the technicians that are required for the EEG and for, um, for the NIR technology. And then, you know, the transcripts of these are fascinating. They're lying to the individuals about whether or not they fail the test. The science on this, if any of you are following it, is really early, right? It's been done on a few test subjects in the labs, which most, you know, are, are about whether or not you're lying about a card, whether or not you're lying about hiding $20, not whether or not you're lying about being a terrorist or having knowledge about terrorist activities that are going on. And this is already being deployed by the military. Okay, the second 
is the military is putting a lot of money into brain decoding. What does that mean? They're trying to figure out what's going on inside of our brains. What are we thinking? NASA has deployed an early kind of program in airports, in just a couple of different airports, where they're trying to do things like screen anxiety levels of passengers going through checkpoints. Now, the science isn't there yet, or we don't think. We don't know, right? Because a lot of the science is happening without our knowledge. But they already have limited test cases where they're rolling this kind of information out. Now, why do I say this? Because who is it that's going to actually question whether or not this technology is appropriate? The second major area is brain stimulation. And this is happening on a much wider level for the military. So brain stimulation and augmented cognition. There's a program by DARPA called AugCog. And AugCog is about augmenting the cognition of the military. And they do things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, direct current stimulation, and one that's interesting from an earlier talk today is um, use of neuropsychopharmacology, in particular oxytocin. Right? They, they said, isn't oxytocin a useful little drug? Well, if we could administer oxytocin and increase the trust level of individuals that we're interrogating, for example, could that be useful? <laughs> right? These are the kinds of things that are going into the reports already. And who's opining about these things? Who's talking about whether or not it's appropriate to do so? Now, if this is happening at the military level, if we're doing things like direct brain stimulation, if we're trying to change the behavior, change the alertness level of our military personnel, change the behavior of individuals to make them more compliant with interrogation techniques, then we have a number of ethical considerations to think about. And it's possible that at a war level, our previous ethical approaches might be appropriate, right? Like just war theory might be a way that we can approach it. But neuroscience provides us with a number of new issues that we're going to have to consider, right? If we're able to change the attitude of an individual, right? We have concerns about concepts of personhood and self, right? Changing uh, the compliance of an individual questions free will, right? Whether or not it's appropriate to be changing a person's will and attitudes. And these concepts are things that we should be talking about, that neuroscientists should be talking about. And given that a lot of this science in particular is happening in the black budget, who is in a better position to be making these kinds of objections? Who's in a better position to be questioning the science that's advancing than the scientific community that's actually participating in the research? Right? So if the scientific community isn't willing to engage in dialogue with policymakers, with the intelligence community, with the defense community, and with lawyers, about the ethical constraints about the research, the ethical application of the research, then who is going to do it? Right? Who's going to talk about the scientific limitations of the work? Who's going to talk about whether or not it's appropriate to be doing lie detection in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan if it's not the scientific personnel? So my candle is to try to reveal some of the applications of science that is happening in criminal law, in the military, and across the uh, across the field, and to invite the scientific community to engage in a dialogue now while the science is in its infancy, before it gets out of control in its application, before the National Research Council report takes off into a full-blown application in the military, when these uses sound like science fiction and sound ludicrous, and yet they're happening and being proposed already by the military. Thank you.